Hey, welcome to Board Game Casual. Today, we're looking at my top 10 new-to-me games of 2023. Now, just to be clear, these aren't necessarily games that were released in 2023, but games that I played for the first time this year. So some of these you may already be well familiar with, and others maybe you let slip by, in which case I highly recommend giving them a look. Let's get into it. We'll start things off with an honorable mention. As satisfying as it would be for this game to be in the number 10 slot, it just didn't quite make the list. Nonetheless, it's a great game, and that game is 10. 10 is a fun little push your luck card game. You flip cards off the top of the deck trying not to bust. You bust if you reach a total of 10. But what's interesting about this game is there's a second type of card in the deck that looks like uh, pips on a die. And these subtract from your total, allowing you to push your luck even further. Although you can also bust if the total of pip cards reaches 10. If you choose to stop, you can choose to take either the numbered cards, which are used for set collection, or the pip cards, which are exchanged for tokens that are used for buying cards later. It's a great light game to pull out when you have people over who aren't super familiar with modern board games, but enjoy playing cards. It'll feel familiar to them. The one thing that I think is a little weak in this game is the auction aspect that happens every time a wild card is flipped. That said, this is a fun little game. It's easy to learn and a great one to add to your shelf if you can find it on sale. My honorable mention, 10. All right, my number 10 new to me game of 2023 is a bit of a cheat because I'm actually going to put two games in this slot that while technically are different games are really two versions of the same core mechanism made by the same designer and they are Raccoon Tycoon and Lizard Wizard. I happened to play Raccoon Tycoon for the first time way back in January. Then, just a few months ago, I played Lizard Wizard for the first time, and I had a bit of deja vu because you can definitely tell that Lizard Wizard feels like an enhanced version of Raccoon Tycoon, or like Raccoon Tycoon with a big built-in expansion on it. Both games are built around the same core dynamic economy mechanism. You have a market of resources, and each resource has a tracker where the value of that resource goes up and down throughout the game. As a player, one of your action options is to play a card that gives you one or more resources, and at the same time, increases the value of other resources. Alternatively, a different action you can take is to sell resources you have for the current value in the tracker. And when selling a resource, it automatically drops the value of that resource in the tracker depending on the quantity you sell. In Raccoon Tycoon, these resources are goods, and ultimately the goal is to make the most money at the end of the game. In Lizard Wizard, these resources are ingredients, and this market is just the first step towards other things you do in the game. The ingredients are used to make potions or sold for mana, and those are then used to acquire wizards and castles and other benefits or set collection aspects to score points in the game. I go back and forth on which one I like better. When I played Lizard Wizard, I initially liked how much more there was to do based on that raccoon tycoon uh, mechanism I was already well familiar with. The more I think about them after playing both, however, I kind of like the simplicity of raccoon tycoon without all the extra bloat. Here's a small example that left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth with Lizard Wizard. I used a bunch of my turns to save up for a spell card that protected against goblins when taking the dungeon exploration action. Basically, drawing cards from a deck uh, that could either be rewards or a monster that kills you. The spell didn't really help because when I went into the dungeon, I was killed by a troll. 
And then later I went into the dungeon again and I was killed by something else. Well, after the game, we came to find out that there was only one goblin card in the whole dungeon deck and it had already come out earlier in the game before I got the card. So all those turns were basically wasted. Now on one hand, the next time I play the game, at least I know better. I know that now there's a one-to-one -one relationship between these spell cards and the monsters they defend against. But holistically, it feels kind of clunky. You have this big deck of spells, but so many of them are really conditional or timing dependent. Um, and those cards just cloud the market if the timing isn't right. I almost feel like it would be better to just have a spell that protects against one enemy, right, of any type, you know, something like that. This was just one example, and it's a little nitpicky, but you know, there were a few things that just didn't feel as streamlined as they could be. That said, if you don't have either game and are wondering which one you should get, I'd say pick the one that sounds more interesting to you. Other factors to consider, Raccoon Tycoon seems like it's pretty widely available. I've seen it at Target, for example, and I know it often goes on sale for pretty cheap. So if budget is a concern, Raccoon Tycoon is a really solid choice. Can't believe I'm saying this, but it also has some of the best paper money I've ever seen. It's kind of laminated and honestly, it works great. Lizard Wizard, on the other hand, comes with one of the best in-game organizers I've ever seen. It has multiple trays with snap-on covers and a place for everything. It's a much bigger and heavier box than Raccoon Tycoon. Either one is fun in my book. That's my number 10, Raccoon Tycoon and Lizard Wizard. My number nine game is The Crew, specifically here, the Crew Mission Deep Sea. Even though I'm not particularly good at this game, and even though my friends are kind of so-so on this game, I like The Crew a lot. The Crew is a small cooperative trick-taking game where you have very limited communication with other players. A big part of the game is knowing when to use your signal that this is the highest card I have of this suit or the lowest card of this suit or the only card I have of this suit. That's about it. It comes with a stack of goals and victory conditions, and before each game, I think they call them missions, you flip one or more of these cards uh, as the goals that you're set to complete. So it gives you a lot of variety from game to game. It plays pretty fast, it's designed to play back to back to see how many missions you can accomplish before you fail, but that also means you can pull it out as a quick warm up or a filler and stop whenever you want. I'm not a huge cooperative game fan, but I do like how everyone's doing their best to work together in this one with really limited communication. Number nine, The Crew, Mission Deep Sea. Number eight on my list is Blitzkrieg. I've wanted this game ever since it came out in 2019, but I always seem to be in between print runs, and for years, it was out of stock anytime I looked. I was finally able to scoop up a copy this year on Nerds Day. Blitzkrieg is a little two-player, tile-pulling, tug-of-war type of game. It touts itself as World War II in 20 minutes, and let me tell you, it delivers on that promise. This game is amazing in how fast it plays. The turns themselves are really quick. You're basically just choosing from one of the three tiles and where to place it. And before I knew it, the game was over. In fact, in our first play, my girlfriend and I realized we missed one of the victory conditions and the game should have really ended two turns earlier. This is a great one to play multiple games back to back. You know, uh, maybe you lose a game, let's go again. At the same time, if you've only got 20 minutes, you can get in a quick game and still feel satisfied. I'm really looking forward to playing this one some more and frankly, getting better at it. I suck at this game, but I still like it a lot. My number eight, Blitzkrieg. The number seven best board game that I played for the first time in 2023 is Wonderland's War. This one really surprised me. Wonderland's War made big waves when it came out last year. It was on all the top 10 lists. But candidly, the art and the theme of Alice in Wonderland for this dudes on a map game just really didn't appeal to me. Combined with the price and the lack of availability, this game wasn't really something on my wanna playlist. 
I was very fortunate that my buddy picked up a copy and brought it over to play. But even going into the game, I was kind of hesitant. I was really surprised at what a great time I had with this game and how much I liked it. What makes this game stand out to me is the bag-pulling combat system. I really like this system. You, of course, have a decent amount of control of what you're putting into your bag, but there's still a good amount left to chance when you're drawing tiles in combat, which makes it really exciting. Plus that push-your-luck aspect, whether or not you want to stop or keep fighting and continuing to draw tiles. In fact, this game made me realize that I just don't like Blood Rage by comparison. In Blood Rage, I often feel helpless in battle, that none of my cards in my hand are strong enough, and no matter which one I pull, my opponent is going to be able to outpower me, and the only person I have to blame is myself. In Wonderland's War, that small element of chance on both sides is just enough to relieve some of the pressure and, and make combat more fun. The fact that you and your opponent do multiple rounds of drawing tiles also makes combat feel a little more back and forth rather than the all or nothing single card draw in Blood Rage. Now combat of course is just one element. There's a lot going on in this game. It's also huge as in it physically takes up a lot of space on the table with the game board, the player boards, and all the components. And admittedly, the rules are a bit of a slog to get through. It feels like there's a lot to cover, but honestly, once you start playing, everything makes sense. The game works very well logically. I'm still not sure if this is a game that I want to buy for myself, but I really was impressed by my play, and I look forward to playing it again. That's my number seven, Wonderland's War. My number six game of this year is Dune Imperium. Now, when Dune Imperium and Lost Ruins of Arnak came out in 2020, these two games were constantly compared to each other. And I thought Dune Imperium was going to be the game for me. For whatever reason, maybe it was the theme and the art, I really wasn't interested in Lost Ruins of Arnak. But wow, after playing both, man was I wrong. I like Lost Ruins of Arnak so much more than Dune. Arnak is one of my favorite favorite games. I actually played Arnak for the first time in 2022, otherwise it'd be at the top of this list. That said, Dune Imperium? Still a great game and one of the best games I played this year. It's got a bit of deck building mixed in with worker placement as well as some head-to-head -head combat with other players. It's a very tight game, so you're really trying to figure out how to best maximize your turns. It's definitely a game I'm itching to play more. I'm really intrigued by the new version, Dune Imperium Uprising, as it sounds like it addresses some of the spots on the board or the factions that didn't feel as useful as some of the others. Hopefully giving players more flexibility to pivot on their strategy mid-game and and find more paths to victory. I'm really excited to play that one. Number six, Dune Imperium. Number five on my new to me list for 2023 is Raiders of the North Sea. Ever since playing Architects of the West Kingdom, which I really enjoy, I've wanted to go back and try its predecessor, Raiders of the North Sea. I bought a copy early last year, which sat unopened on the game shelf for months. And this year I was finally able to get it to the table for the first time. What was really intriguing to me about this game is that the workers are universal. There's no distinction between my workers on the board and your workers. Anyone can use any worker that's on the board as their own. I also really like this idea of place a worker, take a worker. On your turn, you place a worker in your hand onto an empty space on the board and gain the resources or benefits from that space. Then you pick up one of the workers from a different space and gain those benefits as well. So it feels like in one turn, you're getting a lot of stuff. Turns are pretty quick, but there's still a good amount to think through in maximizing your turn while trying not to make things too beneficial for your opponents on their turn. Like Architects of the West Kingdom and the other Shem Phillips Garfield games, I really like the graphic design and some of the art direction here. Unlike other games where the game board can be too dark, the green of the grass and the blue of the water in this game are nice and bright and really make the board pop. Along with the iconography, it 
just makes things really easy to read and understand from afar. I've since gotten the Hall of Heroes expansion, which I've heard is a must-have for the game, particularly in how it opens up more options for players on the board and more paths to form different strategies. So I'm really looking forward to giving it a try with the expansion. I like this one a lot, maybe even better than Architects of the West Kingdom. My number five, Raiders of the North Sea. Number four might be the oldest game on the list, but I was just introduced to it this year, and that's Gizmos. I really like engine building in board games, so this is one of those games that, for me, just clicked right away in the first few rounds. It's a fairly light to medium weight game, maybe similar to Splendor or Century in terms of complexity. The big marble vat in its ramp is an interesting component. It's basically this game's version of drawing cards from a deck and laying them out in a river. But it utilizes gravity in a clever way and makes for an exciting table presence. I had a lot of fun playing this one at my buddy's house. It's certainly a game that I'd consider getting for my shelf, uh, especially if I found it on sale for cheap enough. It's one of those games that's easy to learn and easy to remember how to play and good to introduce to people who maybe aren't heavy gamers. With that, it made it to number four on my list this year, Gizmos. Number three on my list is QE, which stands for Quantitative Easing, for those that are curious. I heard about this game several years back, and I thought it sounded really intriguing. It's an auction game where you can bet as much as you want. You're not limited or tied in any way to the amount of funds you have, or any kind of bank. You can spend as much as you want, but at the end of the game, the player that spends the most is automatically eliminated. It sounds crazy, but it works really, really well. This game is surprisingly fun, and what really elevates it on the list, though, is its utility. This is the perfect game for when you have a group of four or five, where some of those folks aren't big board gamers or have a preconceived notion that they don't like board games because they don't like Monopoly or Trivial Pursuit or, or Catan. This game really shows the range of what a board game can be. As an example, I have a friend who doesn't want to play a board game if there are too many rules. What up, Cheryl? And she has a ton of fun playing QE. It plays pretty fast. There's only four or five rounds. So if after the first game, people are getting the hang of it and like, okay, let's go again. It's really easy to play a second game. There's an expansion that just came out that I'm really excited about called uh, QE Commodities. I believe it adds uh, secondary point scoring items, which are automatically won by the person with the second highest bid. So this sounds like it adds a fun twist. You still might come away with something even if you didn't have the highest bid. Or you might even want to try to bid in a way to get that commodity over the main item on auction. At any rate, QE is a really unique, really straightforward, really fun game. It's a great game to have on your shelf, giving your library a lot of range. My number three, QE. My number two game of this year is Champions of Midgard. This is an interesting one because when I first played this game early in the year, None of us liked it, and honestly, we didn't have a good time. Somehow, we must have gotten some of the rules wrong, because we felt it was really difficult to get troops. There just didn't seem like there were enough spaces on the board for four players, and we had a really rough time constantly getting killed by the monsters. I think maybe we mixed up the monster health for the amount of damage they do? I'm not sure, but... At any rate, it left a really bad taste in our mouths and was put back on the shelf. More than half a year later, I really wanted to get Champions of Midgard back to the table, at least for another try. And man, it was one of the best games I've ever played. We had a ton of fun. 
Now the second time we played with three people instead of four, so maybe there was a little more room on the board, and maybe we got a little luckier with the tiles that came out for random spots, but more importantly, I think we fixed whatever we were doing wrong the first time. Monsters seemed way more easy to defeat. Champions of Midgard is a worker placement game with a dice combat system where players individually go out to defeat monsters and score points. Each warrior is represented by a die, so you want to build up your army by acquiring more dice. This way you can send more warriors to go out and fight. Now, generally speaking, one of my favorite dice mitigation mechanisms is more dice. And this game has that in spades. Players have a lot of agency in mitigating risk by choosing how many dice or troops they want to send out to defeat a monster. So for example, let's say there's a monster that has a reasonable chance of being defeated with just two dice, but to tip the odds in my favor, maybe I wanna send four dice instead. Or maybe I'm so unlucky at rolling and it's such a critical monster for me to defeat, I wanna send eight dice just to be absolutely sure. On the flip side, Maybe I'm trying to be as efficient with my troops as possible. It takes a lot of work to get troops added to your army in a lot of turns, so maybe I'd rather send the minimum number of dice to go fight, allowing me to spread my resources out. The choice is really up to you and how you like to play. I really like this aspect of the game. In Champions of Midgard, while players are playing against each other, there really isn't player-on-player -player combat. We don't fight each other. We're competing for who can beat the most monsters and ultimately get the most victory points. There are other ways to score points as well. In general, I prefer these types of games to the head-to-head -head dudes on a map type game, so this one's right in my wheelhouse. The second play was so much fun, I immediately went out and bought some cheap gold coins as an upgrade for the cardboard tokens because I expect it to hit the table a lot. I also recently just ordered the Valhalla expansion, which is another expansion that I heard is a must have. I believe the Valhalla expansion gives you some benefits or new compensation for the warriors that die in combat, making those dice that you lose worth something, which makes it more rewarding for those that take a chance on combat. Even if I lose a bunch of troops, it's still worth it because I can turn those lost dice into something. I can't wait to give the Valhalla expansion a try. It sounds like the perfect addition to the game. That's my number two game that I played this year, Champions of Midgard. Love it. And my number one new to me game of 2023 is Ready, Set, Bet. Man, I have so much fun with this game. When I first heard about this game, I knew I was gonna like it, particularly for specific occasions like big parties or when you have a lot of players. I'm always on the lookout for games that play well with six or even more but I didn't realize I would like this game this much. This is a game that everyone can get into. It has a wide appeal. I've had success in playing with a mix of gamers, non-gamers, kids, older folks, neighbors, family members, and it's a game where everyone is put on the same playing field. It's a fun, fast-paced, high-energy game that plays in real time. People are placing their bets as they watch the horses race, and everyone's whooping and cheering for their horse to win. What's really awesome about this game is how well it scales. You can have up to eight betting players on a board, but if you wanna accommodate more players, you can easily buy another copy of the game for another eight players to play on that board. Yet everyone can play off the same race, regardless of which board they're on. I have two copies of the game and I'm definitely planning to buy a third the next time I find one on sale. It's also a really easy game to build an entire event theme around. I've already thrown a few Kentucky Derby theme parties, for example, with everyone in costume and horse racing decorations and themed foods. In fact, maybe I'll do a whole video on how to throw a Kentucky Derby theme party around Ready, Set, Bet. But even if it's not a big event, Ready, Set, Bet is an awesome game to play with a group of friends. Now, if you're gonna get the game, and I recommend you do, here are a few tips. Get coin capsules for the betting tokens. It gives them a much better tactile feel and it'll help protect the cardboard tokens that everyone's clutching in their sweaty hands and slamming onto the game board. It also helps keep them from flying around too much. 
30 millimeter coin capsules work great and they're cheap. You can get a hundred for like five to eight bucks. Use the Ready, Set, Bet app to run the horses. I like to stream it up on the big TV for everyone to see. The app has announcers and sound effects and it's a much better way to run the race than rolling the dice by hand on that tiny little board. Get some iron clays or some nice clay poker chips to use instead of the cardboard money tokens. Again, this really just elevates the overall experience of having nice, chunky, familiar winnings. Another alternative is just putting the money tokens into coin capsules like the betting tokens. This is a real cheap way to do it, although you can find nice clay poker chips for pretty cheap on Amazon. Lastly, if you wanna take things to the next level and really wanna spice things up, buy a few small prizes and after the game is over, instead of simply declaring whoever has the most money as the winner, let everyone use their winnings to bid on the prizes in a live auction. You don't have to spend a lot of money for it to be fun. These can be small things like chocolate bars, a unique jar of salsa, some nice hand soap, you know, something like that. Now is the game unplayable without these things? Of course not, but just my advice for making the Ready, Set, Bet experience even better. I've had so much fun with Ready, Set, Bet this year, whether I was just pulling it out with friends or building entire events around. There was no way that this couldn't have been my number one game of 2023. There you have it, my top 10 new to me board games of 2023. This was a great year of board gaming, especially coming out of the pandemic where I didn't get to play a lot of new games. In fact, originally I thought this would be a top five list, but as I started going through everything I played for the first time this year, there was so much to choose from, it clearly needed to become a top 10. And there were a lot of other games I played this year that just didn't make the list. There are also a lot of games that I purchased this year that are still sitting unopened on the shelf. Maybe I need to make a follow-up video on the games I'm most looking forward to playing next year from my uh, shelf of shame. Well, what about you? I'd love to hear what your favorite new to you games were of 2023 down in the comments. Maybe you can help add to the games I need to play next year. Thanks so much for watching. This was a long one. So if you made it this far, you're awesome. I'll see you next time here on Board Game Casual.